Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. On the 16th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th, Wyoming PBS partnered with Think Why, the Wyoming Humanities Council, and hosted a remarkable roundtable discussion between three Vietnam veterans. Dr. William Gribb, Lee Alley, and Scott Ratliff shared their amazing personal insight from their experiences during the Vietnam War. Prior to visiting with the panel, Dr. Nicole Lamartine from the University of Wyoming sang the National Anthem, and Governor Matt Mead provided opening remarks from the Joint Forces Readiness Center in Cheyenne. Vietnam, a Wyoming reflection, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And the home of the brave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today on September 11th, we are honored to have Governor Mead with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 32nd Governor of the State of Wyoming, Governor Matt Mead. Thank you. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you. Craig, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for being here. I want to thank Wyoming PBS and Wyoming Humanities Council for providing this uh, opportunity to have this very important event. I want to thank the distinguished panel in advance uh, for being here. I appreciate it very much, uh, Dr. Scotty. Uh, my friend Lee, you and I have traveled this state uh, a number of times together, and it's always great to be with you. Thank you. I want to thank you, uh, you Vietnam vets, for your service. Uh, I want to thank all our veterans for our service and the men and women who are currently serving. I've got uh, General Luke Reiner here with me. General, thank you and the Guard for all that you do. Uh, and thank you to the families as well who uh, support uh, our military members and our veterans. I've got uh, Judge Gary Hartman who is uh, in my office and a Vietnam vet and uh, is a leader uh, for me in uh, making sure we're doing our best for our military members and our veterans. I've been given about five minutes to talk about uh, Vietnam vets, uh, those who are wounded uh, and how I see it impacting Wyoming. I don't think five minutes is near enough but I understand time is limited. So let me just uh, say a few things here. First, to the 17,000 Vietnam vets we have in Wyoming, thank you, and thank you for your service. We remember the 123 Wyoming citizens who lost their lives in Southeast Asia and their families tonight. And again, to all vets, thank you for your service. Today is Patriots Day. Today is an anniversary of 9-11-2001. You all, and certainly for me, I recall that day with amazing clarity. I recall my grandparents talking about Pearl Harbor, and I was always amazed as a young boy how they could remember it. I recall my parents talking about the day that JFK was shot and killed, and the clarity they could remember that day. For me, 9-11 was that, that way, and I know for many of you. That is the day when we lost 3,000 lives, we lost symbolic structures, and we lost any naive notion this country somehow had that we are immune from terrorist attacks. We remember all of those people, the first responders, the law enforcement, the men and women, those who lost their lives and their families. We remember the men and women who have served after that. It's an amazing country. On Saturday, I came, uh, we had a, a nice occasion where we were welcoming home uh, guard members who had served about a year in Kuwait. It's called a freedom salute. And I bring that up because today as I go to ceremonies where we welcome home our guard members, where we see them deployed, we see the communities coming out in such a large way. The support is amazing. As I travel Wyoming, I'm often asked by people, 
What can we do? What care package can we send to the men and women who are serving overseas? The respect that is given to the men and women today is an amazing and wonderful thing. Times have changed. We remember during the Vietnam era when those people, those warriors who were serving in Vietnam, not one of whom decided to go to war, they weren't the ones who said we're going to war, they are the ones who served. Remember the stories, and uh, certainly I've heard many of them from our Vietnam vets, where they said, don't wear your uniform when you come home. Don't wear your uniform because you may not want people to know you served, because you may be called names, or worse. You may be called names, you may be spit upon, you may be all of these things. It was not wear your uniform because your community, your state, and your country is proud of your service and they want to welcome you home. It shames us as a country to know that we had that period. It shames us as a country when you meet those who served. What they actually wanted was very simple, a recognition and a thanks. And what's so remarkable about our Vietnam vets, what amazes me beyond end, is those same Vietnam vets who were often shunned, who were disrespected, are the ones who stepped up, who have changed this country for the better, who have given us the correct moral compass to show what we need to do as a country, the respect that we need to pay. We think about now, uh, when I go to a Memorial Day ceremony for all the mil military events, so often there is the motorcycles there, the flags, and those are Vietnam vets. We think about Welcome Home Day. Wyoming legislature, God bless them, had the foresight to have a Wyoming Welcome Home Day to honor our Vietnam vets. And on March 30th or thereabouts every year, we travel the state to say welcome home to our Vietnam vets and to our, all our vets. We think about the Vietnam Highway, I-25. What a glorious thing that is. We think about the benefits for our veterans that are given now that were not before. We think about the anniversary remembrance in Casper in 2015 for our Vietnam vets. These things that we know now that are proper to do would not have come about without the very group that was shunned coming together and say, this will not happen again. Their love of their fellow warrior, their love of their country, caused them to rise above any pain that they felt to say to this country, this is not right. It will not happen again. We will respect all those men and women who have served. And it's been a wonderful education for me as I've traveled on these welcome home ceremonies. And you see these Vietnam vets. The simple thing that they want is for somebody to say welcome home. The simple thing that they want is for someone to say thank you for your service. The important thing that they want is for us as a country to never go to an era that they had to experience. As you will have the privilege of hearing from these three amazing men tonight, we recognize, and I say to you three men and to all our Vietnam vets, we know that there is a debt that cannot be repaid for your service, not only during the war, but importantly as well after the war. While it's a debt that cannot be repaid. It is a debt each American should honor and will honor by saying now and forever in the future, we as a state, we as a country, will honor all those who served with great distinction in our military. To all military members, to our Vietnam vets, I say God bless you for your service. Thank you. Hey, buddy. It's your show. <laughs> Very good. You're always so eloquent. You did a great job. Thank you, Governor Meade, for your comments. <clears throat> Author Danny Lateris, when speaking about his book, Viet Man, and about American servicemen who served so gallantly in Vietnam, said this We all went to war. We all got transformed. Some of us came home, but what did we bring? 
what did we bring back? We all came back with Vietnam inside of us, inside of our souls, and in our hearts. Therefore, we are Viet men. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege and honor to introduce our panel here this evening. These three men served and sacrificed in Vietnam, and our hope tonight is to ask them to reflect on their recollections and to share those with you, and to share how their service has impacted their life here in Wyoming. First, we'll introduce to my immediate left, Dr. William Gribb. He was drafted in the U.S. Army in January of 1968 and deployed to Vietnam in December of 1968. He was assigned to Company C, the Wolfhounds of the 25th Division, as a sergeant, stationed in an outpost position near the Cambodian border, and became a platoon leader and staff sergeant. He was severely wounded in August of 1969 and spent two and a half months in hospitals in Vietnam, Japan, and the United States. His military service decorations and awards include the National Defense Service Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Vietnam Ca Campaign Medal, the Air Medal with Cluster, the Bronze Star, and the Purple Heart with Cluster. Currently, Dr. Gribb is a professor and chairman of the Department of Geography at the University of Wyoming. Dr. Gribb, thank you for coming. In the middle is Lee Alley. Lee Alley is a Wyoming native and graduate of the University of Wyoming and previously, previously served as chairman of the Wyoming Veterans Commission. He was deployed to Vietnam in 1967 as an armor lieutenant in the 9th Infantry Division and his list of military decorations and awards include the Distring Distinguished Service Cross, the Soldier's Medal, a Silver Star, Bronze Star, two Air Medals, two Purple Hearts, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry. He has been nominated for our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. Lee was active in real estate and agriculture in Platte County and retired from the Postal Service. Lee, thank you for joining us this evening. Yes, <laughs> On my far left is Scott Ratliff, who was drafted in 1966, served in the 90th Replacement Battalion in Saigon in March of 1967, and was eventually assigned to the 25th Inter Infantry Tropic Lightning Division. While fighting northwest of Saigon, he was shot in combat and lost half of his right lung and the use of his right arm. After discharge, Scott earned a master's degree and worked for Central Wyoming College for 25 years. He served 12 years in the Wyoming legislature and for the past 16 years has served as Senator Mike Enzi's assistant on tribal issues. He has three daughters, six grandchildren, and 11 great-grandchildren. Scott, welcome. Where I want to start tonight is maybe at the beginning of your service in Vietnam. How did you end up in Vietnam? And if you can, tell us about the very first days of your service there. Dr. Gribb? <coughs> well, after training in basic AIT and um, going to sergeant school, I was assigned to Fort Polk as a drill sergeant. And then after that, went to Vietnam. And so my first day there actually was in the first part of December of 68. And, um, Actually, I was scared. I mean, what else can I say? Um, how can you be prepared uh, for war like that? You shared with me your brother had a very different type of service than you did. Yes, my, <laughs> my brother um, went in 1965, and when he went, the war hadn't escalated as much as it had when I got there. And so they did a beachfront landing uh, where they jumped out of the landing craft with their M14s and with no weapon or no ammunition because they were afraid they might shoot each other. So, <laughs> so rather, rather different than what I experienced. So uh, one day in uh, Saigon, I uh, went to Kuchi for one day and then out in the field. So I was out in the field within three days of being in Vietnam. Lee, how did you find yourself in Vietnam? Uh, well, I had just I graduated uh, from officer's candidate school. I went through basic and AIT like everybody else. And uh, because of my test scores, they thought that I should probably go to officer's candidate school. And I did. Uh, from officer's candidate school, uh, I went to jump school. I wanted to jump. And then I went to jungle warfare school in Panama. And uh, I taught leadership in the military for a year. And then, of course, uh, your resume is complete. And sooner or later, you're going to end up in Vietnam. 
So I went to Vietnam in uh, July of 1967. I was uh, headed, because I was an armor officer, I was headed to the 11th Armored Cav. And as soon as I got in country, uh, the, one of the things that I remember so specifically is when you unloaded from that plane, the heat and the smell just took over your whole body. The heat was absolutely unbearable, but the smell is something that you can talk to any Vietnam veteran and they'll tell you the smell is something that they will remember forever. Can you equate that to anything that, well, that you've smelled here? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I think it's a lot of combination of things. Uh, you know, you're landing at, uh, I think we landed at Benoit. Uh, of course, uh, because of the jungle and the, the atmosphere, uh, rotting vegetation, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, sanitary conditions aren't what they w were, so you bundle that all together and, and you get a smell of Vietnam. Uh, I was only in country two days and my orders uh, came that I was to move out and they said, uh, Lieutenant Ali, uh, get on that Jeep, you're headed to Ben Phuc with the 9th Infantry Division. And I said, uh, you must be mistaken. I'm an armor officer, I'm going north to 11th Armored Cav. And uh, the young buck sergeant said, unless you want to walk to Ben Phuc, you ought to get in that Jeep. You don't get to vote here. <laughs> and so I ended up commanding an infantry unit and my learning curve had to be very great because I had never been in the infantry other than basic training. Okay. Scott, how did you find yourself in Vietnam? Well, th this is probably not appropriate, but I kept wondering why we weren't going to North Vietnam. That's where, who we were fighting, and it, it kind of troubled me, but um, m much like the doctor, I landed in Saigon exactly like Lee, the smell, maybe like a locker room in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I've never been in a locker room in Texas, but, but, but hot, um, I mean really, really hot. It, it, uh, just as an example, one day we were at uh, the Red China Sea and it was 123 degrees. And I, I uh, fell asleep on an air mattress and sunburned my butt. And for those of you that was infantry, you know where you carried your claymore. <laughs> Every single step for three days was a paddling. Uh, so, so I landed in, in, uh, in uh, Saigon. It was the 90th replacement. The 90th replacement was just a dumping ground where they they brought people and then they sent you where you, you were needed, right. and so I went to uh, to play coup, which was part of the fourth division at the time, and and it, it was beautiful. It was kind of what what I was used to. There was mountains and trees, and I mean it was really pretty. The the thing that was horrible was they was going to give us this in country experience. And so we go just off the base and they've got a hand grenade uh, place where you're gonna love hand grenades. And some kid froze up and dropped his hand grenade and, and you know, you, you, you talk about these things when you're going through training, that, that people die, that, that, that accidents happen and some aren't accidents. And, but, but when you first experience it, you, you all of a sudden, I mean, it just comes on you like, holy, this isn't a game anymore. This, this is where people really do get hurt, maimed, or die. And uh, I remember that incident till I die. It was, it was horrible. So from I there, I went to, to uh, the 25th Infantry. And uh, I want to talk about more about your con your direct combat in just a moment. But I'm curious to know. And I'm going to play a clip, but I'll ask you the question, if you understood why you were there. We have a clip that I'd like to play. Um, it's, it's our video number one. And these are clips from Ken Burns' documentary that will air on PBS. If we could show that video right now. 
I just stayed awake last night thinking about this thing. The more I think of it, I don't know what in the hell. Uh, it looks like me we're getting into another Korea. It just worries the hell out of me. I don't see what we can ever hope to get out of there with once we're committed. I don't think it's worth fighting for, and I don't think we can get out. And it's just the biggest damn mess. It I is. Have, so. It's an awful mess. And I just thought about ordering Ordered those kids in there. there, and what in the hell am I ordering him out there for? One what thing that the is to me. Man worth to me. What is it worth to this country? Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, if you start running the communist, they may just chase you right into your own kitchen. Yeah. That's the trouble. And well, that is what the rest of the uh, that half of the world is going to think if this thing comes apart on us. Our president didn't know why we were there. Did you, Dr. Gribb? Uh, no. I mean, I had watched the news, and I thought that uh, we were there to try and stop communism, you know, and uh, the domino effect. But once I got there, I realized that that was not really it. That uh, we were there, and I transformed it to, I was there to make sure I got home and that my platoon got home. Um, it wasn't to take, like Scotty said, it wasn't to invade a country, it wasn't to protect an area. It was basically once I got there and realized my role in life was to get home, period. Lee? Well, I think, Doctor, uh, it's very well said. My, uh, once I got in country and you realize this is real, you are here, you're gonna be here for a year, You've got to make some decisions in life of how you're going to survive this thing. So to me, the spread of communism, all of that stuff just went out the window. I could care less about it. I didn't read about it. I didn't want to know about it. I could care less. I had one very strict mission, and my mission was very simple, and it was to get my men home alive, and that's all that I cared about. I could care less about what was going on in the United States. I could care less about the spread of communism. I wanted my men to go home, and I... Uh, uh, I, I lost some men. Scott? Um, well, I, I guess um, I was a little older than both these gentlemen when I went in. I was 24 years old. And I, I'm not saying that I thought differently because I don't know how anyone else thinks, but I was questioning because people were starting to go to Canada. And, and, and they were looked down upon in my community. I mean, anybody that even talked about going. And so uh, I think everybody I ever knew was pretty patriotic, but they were still questioning, what, why are you going, what are, you, what are, we, what are we doing? And, um, and so that was on the back of your mind um, you even had those thoughts going through basic and AIT. Like Lee said, and, and, and I can't say it as well as he did, but once you got there, you, you really did very quickly make a decision that if you were second guessing yourself, you, 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 you were endangering people you cared for and yourself. So you had to, you had to, to you had to mentally get yourself to, to the point of, this is where I'm at, and this is what I have to do, or I won't go back. And, and I think the people that came back, I mean, a lot of other people did too, but, but we had to do that to survive. You talked about some people you knew, or, or, or some Americans who went to Canada to avoid service. Has your attitude about their decision changed in your mind today compared to what it may have been at the time? Whoever wants to answer that question. Well, I had a, I had a. I should say you were from Michigan. You had relatives in Canada. Right. So half my family is Canadian. And we lived in Detroit, and so just across the river is Windsor. And every summer I spent uh, in Canada working on my aunt's farms. So it would have been very simple for me to cross the river and go to Canada. Um, and the reason I didn't do that is because, as you said earlier, my brother had gone to Vietnam before me, and I thought that I was obligated to follow his lead. Lee, has your opinion on people who went to Canada changed at all? 
Yeah, I think it has. I think at the time, uh, well, I not think, I know at the time I was very uh, put out with those people. I thought, you know, it's one for all, all for one. If one of us has to go, y'all got to go and don't run and hide. Uh, I think it was a cowardly way out. Uh, as I get older and you start to have uh, family, you have sons and you have grandchildren and you look at them and you think, uh, maybe I'll take you to Canada before I want you to get shot. <laughs> so I have softened a lot, yes. Scott, your thoughts? Um. I have three daughters, and uh, at the time I was there, I had two. Um, I didn't know what my third one was going to be, but I prayed it would be a girl, because uh, I don't—I didn't want anyone to ever face war. Uh, and much like Lee, I—I I, I don't know that I thought they was coward. I think I was too much of a coward to ponder it. Uh, I, I really do. It was easier to go along than to, to stay with my convictions. And, uh, and I wasn't convinced that was a solution, but I didn't know that going was a solution either. Today, I think they did the right thing. By going to Canada. Absolutely. It makes me wonder what questions we all should ask when our commander-in-chief, regardless of which political party he's from or she's from. But when he or she talks about committing American troops to serve in combat, what questions should we ask? And I'll take it one step further, is protesting and questioning unpatriotic? I think your second question, uh, I don't think that's unpatriotic. I think that we have built into our system the value of presenting your opinion. And if that opinion is different than the political opinion at the time, so be it. I mean, we have a freedom of speech, and I think that's um, the foundation of, of, our, of our government and our, our country. Um, relative to the first question, what was that again? <laughs> I mean, the, the question is, is that, um, is it unpatriotic no. to protest? And, and you've answered that. And what questions should we ask our leaders? Um, what questions should we openly discuss if our commander in chief is wanting to commit our American troops to combat? Yeah, I think with that question, I think we have to look very seriously. And, and use the example of Vietnam and possibly other wars, and that of what purpose is that war relative to the safety of the United States? I think that's the question that has to be asked. Lee, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I absolutely believe in the freedom of speech, and I, uh, I have no problem with the uh, uh, people expressing that in the form of protest. Uh, I think they take it too far when they start to destroy other people's property and it gets out of hand, but a simple protest and uh, exercising your freedom of speech, as far as I'm concerned, that's what we are. A lot of guys have fought and died for. So, absolutely, I, I, I have no problem with that what, whatsoever. What do you think about when our commander in chief talks about committing troops to combat? Well, I, I'm going to pass this off to Scotty because I don't want to steal his thunder. I think he said exactly what I was thinking. So, well, I'm just going to say ditto. <laughs> In advance, and 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 so we're clear. I, I agree with both these guys on on the second part first. Um, when when we when we had 9/11 happen, and after the Vietnam War, I swear I would I would never hurt another person. I would have I would have went to Afghanistan. I think I think Afghanistan had done something severe enough for us to warrant war. I do not think we had any business going to Iraq, and I think it's been borne out. Now, we've heard this and that, but that's my opinion. We, we, we don't. I think, honestly, the president, whoever that person is, should say, would I send my son in the infantry to this place? 
uh, and these guys know what I mean when I say in the infantry, there are people that can go and claim being in Vietnam, and they were, and they were important there, but they weren't necessarily having to endure the pain that comes with, with some of the, 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 the misery. And, and so if, if, if it's important enough for your own, then I think, uh, I think that ought, and, and I'm not saying that we just go sacrifice a son. That's not what I'm saying. It's, it needs to be a real reason. Should we draft again someday? I don't know about a, a draft for just the military, as we had talked about earlier. It could be for uh, a national service, and so that you can take the option of doing one or the other. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I, I believe there's no finer thing that uh, a young man or lady can do than to serve their country. Uh, so I would certainly be in favor of instituting some kind of service. It doesn't have to be carrying a gun and a bunch of hand grenades on your back. There's a million things that this uh, people could do from clerk typist to whatever. Uh, so I think two years of some kind of service to your nation would be honorable. Can I add? Dr. Grimm, sure. Well, I, I think that uh, there's another component to this. And the other component is that whether it's in the military or in the national service, that almost everybody learns something, a skill of some type. And so if they had a national service, then once they got out, they would have a skill that, that would then improve their employment or their employability. And so I think if that's a concern now for young people, then this is not necessarily the way to do it, but it's an option that, like the AmeriCorps or other uh, service activities like that, that give students or for young people a skill that they can then use once they're done with their service. As I said earlier, I want to return for just a moment about your time in combat. We have a video that we'd like to, to show about that, and it's video number four. I'd like to show that to our audience right now. Soldiers adapt. You go over there with one mindset, you know, and then you adapt. You adapt to the atrocities of war. You adapt to killing, dying. You know, left a wall doesn't bother you. I should say it doesn't bother you as much. When I first arrived in Vietnam, there were some, there were some interesting things that happened and I questioned some of the Marines. I was made to realize that this is war and this is what we do. And that stuck in my head. This is war, this is what we do. And after a while, you embrace that. This is war. This is what we do. I want to ask is, is how did you cope? Someone from my generation who grew up post Vietnam can't understand what you went through. How did you cope? <clears throat> I think one way to think about it is that um, I put more, f hmm, curious. I'm not very religious now, but I was very religious then. And so I coped by making sure that he understood that I was trying to do the right thing, he being the spirit. And um, so, but it was more of an inner religion than it was an outward religion for me. Lee, how, how did you deal with what you saw? Well, as a, as a commander of troops, uh, to me, uh, it was my daily focus. I mean, I went to bed thinking about my men. I woke up thinking about my men. And so it, it was just complete focus. That's how, I, uh, that's how I survived. One of the things that the gentleman said on the clip, which uh, really hit home to me, I found, I felt I was getting in trouble in Vietnam when all of a sudden it started becoming easy. 
I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but uh, killing and it, it just came easy and I could feel myself almost sliding to the dark side and that's when I really started worrying about uh, not staying in the military and getting out because uh, uh, it, it becomes easy. It did for me anyway. Scott? Well, I understand what Lee said. Uh, I, I didn't get there, but I seen guys that did. Uh, guys that would re-up two and three times. The, I mean, they, they had found their niche. And I, and I, and I sad for those people because I, I don't know how they, how they adjusted when they got out. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I think I'm fairly spiritual today, but, but I certainly, you know, you, you certainly visit with the Creator when you're over there. There's pretty often, um, and. I had probably some tendency towards alcoholism before I went, but I certainly mastered it after I got back. People often ask me about religion, and I said, you know, I've never met an atheist in a foxhole. <laughs> sure, sure. Let's talk about your, your experience in communicating. today. Veteran or today, servicemen and women, I think, communicate very differently with their family. What did your family know about your service while you were in combat? Anything? Um, I uh, um, was there for nine and a half months, and I was in combat literally for nine and a half months. We would go out for four days, come back for three, go out for four, come back for three, every continually. And so my letters home uh, didn't mention that part. I was just mainly talking about what I was doing um, uh, on everyday things, but not anything about the war. I mean, uh, my thought was it was too, it would be too hard for them. Leader Scott, did you share much with your family while you were in combat? Well, that's kind of interesting because, uh, uh, like the doctor, my brother went to Vietnam before I did, and. Uh, like Scott said, in Vietnam, not everybody was in the battle. Uh, and he was in a place called the Train, which was like a beautiful beach resort. I mean, it's really gorgeous. And he came back with one of the most beautiful suntans you ever saw. So when I went, I had my mom and dad convinced in my letters that I had taken Ralph's job. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry, mom and dad. Things are good here on the beach, you know. And I'm Nothing having... could have been farther from the truth. And, uh, one of the battles that I was in uh, uh, hit national news, and my name was uh, came out on the national press, and I uh, I got the come to Jesus letter from mom saying I don't think you're laying on the beach, <laughs> so what are you doing? And uh, so you know when you wrote home, you didn't share those kind of things. You just talked about. S same with you, Scott. I wrote a lot of letters. I probably wrote more letters in the time I was there. Than, than I have since. Uh, and, and I, I you know, you, a, a lot of that stuff you don't think about all day long. I mean, you try to just suppress it. And so I would tell stories about the ants eating the, 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 that pound cake. And, the, you know, I mean, you, 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 you tell what's, you, you laugh at some of the craziest things over there. One of the big communication deals in those days was the little cassette recordings. You know, everybody had the little cassettes and you'd run to the PX and buy a cassette recording and you would sit down and, and tell about the monkey that was chasing the dog. And I mean, you'd tell them all these funny things and you send a cassette and a month later you'd get a cassette back. That was a, one of the great ways to communicate because you could hear their voice. I want to talk to you now about your service when you came home. And we have another clip that we would like to share. It's video number five. We'll play it and then we'll talk about it. Khi mà nhìn đồng đội tôi hy sinh thì tôi có thể nói rằng là lúc ấy thương đồng đội. Không phải là là lúc ấy chảy nước mắt ngay mà nén vào trong lòng. Là nó cũng rất bàng hoàng về mặt tâm lý.
After three days and two nights of combat, helicopters began lifting out the American survivors and gathering up the dead. When you look at them, it doesn't even resemble a human body. It just it looks just like a mannequin. You look at them and you say, that couldn't happen to me. I saw them fight at the Adram. It always galls me when I read or hear about the World War II generation as the greatest generation. These kids were just as gallant and as courageous as anybody who fought in World War II. As the governor talked about briefly, and uh, we've talked about off camera, not only did Americans treat you, treated you differently, but American veterans also treated you differently. How do you feel when people talk about the greatest generation and you know they're not talking necessarily about you and your service? Scotty, let me start with you about that. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know that I've heard people talk about us as being a lesser generation. I think when we came back, it was tough. I mean, it wasn't so tough in Wyoming, I don't think. I, I was living in Colorado at the time, and, and uh, I was going to college there, and it was about the time SDS was, was firing up, and, and so there was, there was a lot of protest and frustration, and I was troubled by dude, where, what side of the street do I walk on with that? But um, I didn't experience a lot of like people spitting on me or, or putting me down for, I, I, I don't doubt that it happened at all. Uh, it was just, you know, the community I come from, I was relatively well known, so. Before we move on, Scotty, were you treated differently because you were a Native American? Not in the service, no. No. Lee, what about you? You, you had opportunity to talk with veterans from right. many different wars or conflicts. Yeah, I, I've had the, uh, uh, and I call it an honor, I've had an honor to serve on the Wyoming I mean, Veterans Commission for uh, 10 or 12 years. And uh, on that commission, you deal with veterans of every war. Uh, I tell the story a lot about uh, when I came back to University of Wyoming, I was trying to find myself and who I was and who I could hang out with. And I finally ended up in the American Legion in Laramie, Wyoming, and there was one other gentleman in there. And he looked at me and he said, because of your age, you must be Vietnam. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, you know, we won our war. And because of that incident, I never stepped foot in an American Legion or a VFW for 30 years. Uh, I had felt a sting and I didn't like it. But going on to the Veterans Commission and working with all these different veterans, uh, it, it's fine. You know, every, every generation has their time. And one of the things that I try to do when I go around the country and talk now is the World War II generation is one thing, the Korean War generation is another thing. But right now, the biggest veterans population is the Vietnam veterans, so it's your turn. So if you're not getting what you want, and if you're not getting treated the, what you, the way you want, it's your fault. We're the veterans. Let's step up and take control of this thing. Do you feel that changing? I do. Mm -hmm. I was telling somebody out in the hall, it's kind of interesting, because when I went to Vietnam, nobody wanted to go, and now you have all these wannabes that want to be a Vietnam veteran. I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how'd that happen? Dr. Gibbon, does it bother you the way Vietnam veterans are generally thought about, even though maybe how Vietnam veterans are treated is changing? Um, it doesn't bother me, but I think that, uh, I mean, the biggest thing is that uh, we should be treated as any other veteran, um, whether they were in World War II or Korean War or the current war. Um, and I think that. That's one part. The other part is that everybody should have an equal opportunity uh, to receive the benefits, like through the Veterans Affairs and so forth, um, at, at an equal amount. Um, I think the, the biggest difference after the war is that Vietnam was radically different in that you basically went 
to the war as an individual, and then you were assigned to a company and so forth. So you had no camaraderie beforehand, and when you got out, it was the exact same thing. You got out by yourself, and you didn't have any camaraderie afterwards from the same people that were in your platoon or brigade or whatever it might be. And so in all the wars before that and the wars since then, um, you go as a company or a platoon or a, a battalion, and you come back as a battalion. So you have that interaction and that support group. Vietnam didn't have that, and I think that's a radical difference. I want to talk to you just a little bit. We had an opportunity at the um, walk at the Vietnam Welcome Home to hear from Joe Galloway, who is a famous reporter in the Vietnam era. We have a clip I'd like to share, and then I'd like to talk about how you perceive the role of press and media today in covering events and conflicts. You can't just be a neutral witness to something like war. It crawls down your throat. It eats you alive from the inside and the out. It's not something that you can stand back and be neutral and objective and all of those things we try to be as reporters and journalists, photographers. It doesn't work that way. The growing presence of American combat troops in Vietnam attracted flocks of journalists. There was no press censorship as there had been in World War II. Reporters just had to agree to follow military guidelines so as not to compromise the security of ongoing operations. It was dangerous work. More than 200 journalists and photographers would die covering the fighting in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> I think it's fair to say the media is maybe under attack for the way we conduct how we do things today. What role do you perceive the media and the press have to report on our conflicts in Afghanistan, in Iraq, what's happening in North Korea? What is the press's role? Well, I think um, when we were watching the news, there, there were reporters and so forth embedded in those military operations. And I think Maybe Vietnam was the beginning of that, and that they could actually then see things from the ground view. Um, the objectivity part, the subjectivity part, I don't think you can ever separate those out, because you're there and you're feeling it at that point in time. And you may have your feelings, but you also see what's going on. So I think it's very difficult for journalists to be objective and subjective at the same time. Is it a requirement that press be able to document and to report in times of conflict? Oh, I would say absolutely. We, uh, we didn't have a lot of them, but every so often somebody would come through from Time Magazine or uh, some reporter, and uh, our biggest uh, fear was getting them killed. I, you know, I think, what are you doing out here? You know, you sh and I was always just amazed at uh, how brave some of these men and women were to come out and be in the field and, and be a part of that. So I always respected them, and I think, uh, uh, yeah, in the war there should be no secrets. If you're out there doing it, and that's, yeah, I don't have any problem with them out there. Well, neither do I. Uh, I, I, I noticed that in the, in the Iraqian war, um, news started not being there, and people kind of, didn't pay much attention to it. Like, prior to going to Vietnam, I think most people knew what was going on or at least pay, watched the news. And, and, and uh, one, one of the, my colleagues here said, it was Lee that his, he was in a, a firefight that is seen. 
I'm not sure that you'd see a firefight where, where you'd recognize people today. It just, it's, uh, I, it's really important. Craig, and I'm not getting it said right, but, but I, think, uh, I think the only way that things ever get to the point where they maybe end is if, if in fact the world is more aware of what's really going on. I mean, Lyndon Johnson had all the information that anybody had, and you know, it took him six years. To have you gotten the services that you each individually have needed from the day that you were discharged to today? Uh, the services relative to the benefits? To being a veteran. Mm -hmm. I would say yes. Um, I've never really had to utilize my medical, um, but certainly my education services got me to where I am now. That's for sure. Lee, you have some severe struggles. Yes, I did. When you came back from Vietnam. Uh, you know, in my, uh, uh, it only took me 30 years to figure it out. But, you know, hell, a slow learner, I guess. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I just did not think I had anything coming, and I didn't expect anything. And so I didn't know. I mean, I didn't even know the, that they were out here. In today's military and uh, the general sitting here, they do such a great job with these young men and women coming back and they, they sit them down and they explain the benefits and they explain all this to them. Uh, we were in combat one day and in the United States the next day, so we didn't know. And the only way that I ever got hooked up with the VA was I had a very severe heart attack about 15 years ago and my doctor said, Lee, uh, you're a veteran. Did you ever think of going to the VA? And I said, well, why would I do that? And he said, well, you're going to be on some medication the rest of your life. Check it out. And uh, so I did check it out, and the VA has been very good to me. Uh, I, I, I think they treat me very good. And uh, it, the, 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 the one thing that I tell all veterans, that it, it's out there, but you've got to go get it. Scott? Um, I've had wonderful medical assistance from the VA. Uh, the area that I felt like they were a little bit short and a long time getting there was was maybe more for the mental health. Uh, and I don't know for sure whether I would have used it until I got kind of uh, to the point where I absolutely needed to. But when I did go, uh, unfortunately, they they had a counselor who had never been in the service, uh, certainly had never been to war. And though he had the credentials to be a counselor, uh, his very first solution for me was to put me on meds. And as I mentioned earlier, I was an alcoholic, or I alluded to it, and I, I was. I mean, there's no question I was an alcoholic. And, and I found quite a few of my veteran friends that have been alcoholics because they, they seen some pretty ugly stuff over there. Um, so if I was going to make a suggestion to the VA, it would be to recruit some, some vets that, that have some understanding of, of what it's like. I'd like to finish with this and we have a, a, a couple minutes left. It's been said that service shapes character with a commitment to values and ideals, our, our democracy if you will and a willingness to die. Are you concerned that those values and a commitment to the greater good are absent from the way American youth or our education systems are teaching our American youth about service today? I think that um, the service part well, it's different because now it's a voluntary army. And so uh, there isn't that real commitment to the country uh, that maybe we felt as draftees and so forth, but um, that uh, people now only go into the military uh, because that's their option. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, giving them a for that group, there's a commitment to the, to the country. For those that are 
not volunteering um, and not maybe doing other Peace Corps or some other service, maybe they don't feel as obligated to the country. It's interesting that we have three people on stage tonight that have been involved in education in one way or the other. Lee, what are your thoughts on about the way American youth today perceive country and service? Well, I, uh, uh, I've been fortunate to travel the country and talk to different youth groups and stuff like that, and I just, uh, I just have all the respect in the world for the youth of America. I mean, you know, maybe they're not being taught the way we were taught, maybe not, but uh, these kids are good kids, and, uh, and I'm just proud, you know, I look at my son and my grandkids and everything else, and uh, they're just good people, and, and then they'll be fine, and the country will be fine. We're going to hit some rough roads, but it's going to be okay. Your perception, Scott? I'm not sure that it's the school's jobs to try to teach uh, what you're talking about. I think, I think those are community kinds of things and parental kinds of things. And I say community because I, I think communities can involve kids and, and let them be a part of. I see a soldier today and most of them that I see are still doing things for their community. It, it isn't that they just served in the military. They serve on boards. They serve on, uh, you know, they'll serve food. They'll, uh, they, they keep on giving. And, um, and I, think, I think a community that's a good neighbor to each other, I think that's where kids learn uh, what it's like to be a part of. Uh, certainly the schools can can do some of that too but I don't think it's just the school's responsibility. Dr. Ever you wanted to add something? No, I, mean, I think what, what we're seeing now is that it's called civic engagement and more and more schools are doing that part and getting the students to be involved in their community in one way or another. I mean the university uh, literally just put a new position out uh, recently for a person involved in civic engagement. So I think it is getting there, but maybe you know, it's 30 years late, who knows? Well, please join me in thanking our panel um, for this fantastic discussion. Thank you all again for your service and for your sacrifice and for being with us here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.